Edgar Mott. Yeah, I have such an adrenaline high when I get... There's two things we found. One, one is we could look at the scares, analyse if our expected scares were working effectively. Were people shrieking and covering their hands or were they getting an emotional response from it? And being scientific about it means that we strip out people's opinions about whether things are working or not. We've got data and we look at the data. If it's working, we're happy with it. Really scary. <laughs> but scared and... Wanting to get away. <laughs> um, I actually be maybe a bit scared to play on my own, but <laughs> in a room with the lights on, yeah, with some other people as well, yeah, maybe. But because I'm a scaredy cat, I would play with someone in the room. <laughs> and the lights on. It was one of the scariest games I've played in a long while. Hey, Graham. Hi, my name is Graham Resnick. I'm a filmmaker, writer, director, sound designer, and uh, I started working with Larry Fassenden about. 10, 15 years ago through my friend Ty West, who I grew up with and uh, have done a lot of sound design with on his films. And uh, he was producing Ty's films at the time and uh, Ty introduced me to Larry. Larry produced my first feature and we've written together on several projects. My name is Larry Fesenden, I'm a filmmaker. I, uh, I run Glass Eye Picks, which is um, an independent production company out of New York. We make indie movies, uh, a lot of scary movies as well. Um, and uh, I got a call to audition to write uh, this video game. And uh, I called my pal Graham Resnick because Graham's a gamer. And um, while I thought I could offer something to the idea of writing this multi-branching story, I knew that I would want Graham's expertise as a lover of uh, gameplay since I guess games were started. So, and, and, and just as a lover. That's, and as a lover, yeah. yes. <laughs> Which uh, is why there's so many sex jokes in the yeah. in the game. <laughs> there was one Italian website that did say the Larry oh, Fessenden right. and Graham Resnick, the two lovers behind <laughs> Until Dawn. Come here. Maybe I know how to handle you too. I am definitely ready to be handled. So uh, I wanted Graham by my side. Uh, yeah, and we we got the gig, and it was it's been an amazing ride. So in the game, the, the basic setup is that uh, a year prior to the game's start, all these kids had gone up to a, a ski lodge that was owned by the parents of one of the kids, uh, or a couple of the kids, and um, some of the teenagers played a prank on some of the other teenagers, and a terrible tragedy occurred when a few of them, uh, two sisters, ran out into a blizzard, and uh, were never seen from again. <laughs> So now, a year later, uh, this has kind of torn apart this group of friends. They've, uh, they've gone through some trials and tribulations in the past year. The brother of the two girls has uh, had a lot of psychological issues. And, and to kind of help him cope uh, and help them all get over it, they all return to the lodge a year later, back up on the mountain. And uh, the idea is to, to get over it, but... Um, the healing does not begin. <laughs> Yeah. And these kids are all trying to find themselves. They've, they've, they've been through a trauma, but in general, they're just teenagers trying to figure out who they are. So they're all kind of falling into the patterns, the, the stereotypes, the, the characters they see on TV and in the movies. I think we were very interested in taking genre tropes and kind of making them uh, sort of refresh them. That's it, it just be us this weekend. We're familiar with how slasher movies work. Uh, you know, most people have seen some horror movies, and we have established notions and preconceptions about the roles of the players in horror movies and how they talk and how they get killed and how they have sex. And to bring you into the game that way and then subvert a lot of those expectations was kind of our, our goal. They're haunted by some incident that happened in their past, which I think you pretty much figure out that that's going to have a role in their uh, in their interaction. <laughs> yeah, so I think what was fun was we take some sort of stock characters and we try to give them some shape, but um, at least at the beginning they're recognizable in the um, in the way of groups of friends. There's, you know, the jock and the yeah. um, and the bitchy girl and the rivalries between everyone and Oh my gosh. Um, and really fun characters too. Like these it's 
We just had so much fun living in the minds of these characters through writing the writing the script. What do you think? Ah! Jesus! <laughs> you know, it was fun. We I think we were looking to get that kind of banter that you yeah. see both in movies, but also that you absolutely have with friends and sort of those inside jokes. And of course, as writers and as friends ourselves, we sort of developed little tracks and we try right. to give the characters that kind of vibe. Jason Graves, and I'm the composer for Until Dawn. I've been involved with Until Dawn for about a year now. Originally, I was contacted by Barney Pratt, the audio director. I think that had something to do with my lineage of horror games, and hopefully not the fact that my last name is Graves, although a lot of people seem to associate my name with scary music. One of the things that was really exciting about working with Barney and the team at Supermassive is they really wanted something unique for the music. They wanted the music to stand out and be a character on its own in the game. When I'm first starting on a new score, and it doesn't matter if it's film, television, or games, I always end up going to the main theme. Sometimes the developer or producer isn't even necessarily interested in the main theme at the beginning. I just want to do it for myself because for me the main theme is the identity of the game. It establishes the mood, the atmosphere, and the character of the music and how it's going to be playing in the background. And that's what we did with Until Dawn. That was actually my demo pitch to Supermassive Games. I put a main theme together, recorded all the instruments at my studio, and sent it to them. And they liked it. We actually ended up recording that exact theme, all the instruments and everything, live here at Ocean Way probably nine months ago. And that's what we've been using in all the demos for the game. And that's the final version of the theme that is the main theme that you'll hear on the menus and in some key pieces of gameplay. seem to have made a name for myself in horror. And there's something about scary music, I think it's maybe the lack of rules. But the biggest rule in scary music is there are no rules, so you can do anything you want, and actually, if you end up doing things that don't feel like they would work out together, they kind of clash and it ends up being even more effective for scary music. So that's what really drew me to Until Dawn, was the textures plus writing thematic material that is interwoven with the scary textures. I haven't really done anything like that before. Usually it was just all, all tension all the time, and that's fun and it's great, but I'm actually at heart a very melodic composer. That's the kind of music I love listening to, and that's the kind of music I love writing. That's the kind of music I got to work on in Until Dawn. <laughs> My name is Will Biles, Executive Creative Director of Until Dawn. The first part of getting a believable facial performance in game is to capture topographically the actor's range of emotional expressions as separate versions of the same head. Every tiny nuance gets digitized and merged, effectively creating a model that can recreate every facial movement that the actor makes. Once the topography has been recorded, the actor's performance itself can be captured by using a predetermined set of marker points, drawn precisely on the face, and a high-def helmet cam, 
wirelessly linked to capture devices. The camera is the small box where it looks like the microphone should be. Outro Sam. Mark. It records in high def the movement of the dots throughout the performance that will drive the expressions captured earlier. Unlike other systems, this form of capture is far less lossy because there are fewer interpretations between performance captured and performance rendered finally in game. The audio is also recorded via two separate Lavalier mics attached to the helmet. It takes a while for the actors to acclimatize to carrying around the recording devices and the helmet cams, but very soon the shoot becomes similar to any other effects shoot or a green screen shoot. The actors in these scenes are only recording facial animation, but use cursory body movements for pacing. Wait, and maybe we should all stick together and find everybody and make sure they're all okay, so... 1-1, one, one, the year before the prank. Take two, Mark. Other than the other actors, they have to use their imagination for everything and everywhere that they are supposed to be seeing and feeling. From a hot midday studio in Los Angeles to a freezing midnight mountain in British Columbia. Because Until Dawn has a dynamic, ever changing story, the facial performances and the body performances are recorded separately with different systems. With the body capture, we use reflective bead suits and an infrared camera matrix system that drives the CG bone hierarchies in our character models. These performances cover everything from character locomotion, scene-specific performances and stunt work, most of which was recorded at studios in Pinewood and Shepparton, near London. Anna! Combining all the elements seamlessly in the final game becomes a formidable editing and logistical task. Every variation, both physical and emotional, must be combined in these multi-edits. Scaffolding props have to stand in for the sets, because the hundreds of infrared cameras have to be able to see all of the reflective beads on the actor. 